So tonight's topic is identifications of love, which might be a little different than what you're thinking it is. But I just, before I start, I want to just make a correction. Last week I said that um, Pastor says work like an owner. He actually says think like an owner. So I just wanted to go on record for uh, correcting my mistake. Um, anyway, we are designed to give love and to receive love and know in our spirits that love is necessary nourishment to our lives. But are we able to receive love in its infinite forms of expression offered by God and others? Or do we identify and accept love only when it comes in a few select packages? Now you're gonna get the understanding of what a package of love is as I go on. So in this lesson, the identifications of love are packages of words, gestures, actions, and attitudes that we interpret as love from other people. Formed from childhood, these packages are idols which define and limit our idea of what true love really is. They are also assuredly deny us the joy of giving and receiving love at its fullest. When we demand our identification of love from those around us, we defile those relationships that we value the most because it's usually the people that we love the most that we demand our identification of love from. God desires to bring freedom to both give and receive expressions of love that he has in so many forms. Those who have identifications of love believe that they come in the packages. They come in packages, packages that we have formed ourselves. Identifications are formed out of the snapshots of our childhood. We all have them. Maybe you don't know you have them yet, but you will by the end of the night. And good expressions of love, when they are experienced in, as John Sanford says, copious ways and varied, varied ways, we learn to recognize love in lots of different packages. But when it's handed out sparingly, we latch on to that few meager little things that we have as expressions of love, and they become idols in our life. And we know God hates idols. It says, the first commandment, Exodus 22, 22, it says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Our identifications of love can be idols in our life, but they need to come to death on the cross. And when I looked, I was looking at the word identifications, I saw ident. And it's, a, and I heard the Lord say, it's a dent in our ability to receive love. So you know when, and I saw like cups, you know when you're going to drink out of a cup and it's all, it's got dents in it and stuff, it's a little bit harder to drink out of it, it's harder to get the food out of a dent it can. Well, it's the same thing with our um, ability to receive love. Before we move on, I'm going to read you a little story that did Sanford say. So you could get an idea of what this actually is before we go on. So a wife came to them and reported that her husband was a hardworking farmer. Or her, I'm sorry, her father was a hardworking farmer. He rose early and labored in the fields until sunset. He was a kind and loving man, but after evening, the evening meal, he would tumble exhaustedly into bed so she hardly ever saw him. The one time that he was truly present for her was when she became ill. He would postpone his chores, stay home, fix delicious chicken soup for her. He would sit by her bed, put his warm, strong hand on her forehead, speak reassuringly to her, and linger until she was, he was satisfied that she was all right. That was how she grew to identify love. According to, the, uh, according to the package in which it came. So the package of love was when she was sick, her dad would make her chicken soup and take care of her. 
She learned how to wallow in such attention, milking every headache and fever for all it was worth. Naturally, she married a workaholic like her father, kind and gentle, but was gone most of the time. The first time she developed a migraine, she went to bed and waited for the chicken soup. Now you all know. <laughs> she called out and cried out for help, but her husband only said, you're a big girl now, take some aspirin, you'll get over it, and he went to work. She was devastated. This man doesn't love me. Of course he did. And her mind accepted that within a few months. But it took her heart years to learn how to recognize and receive real love for what he had to give her in his own way. Okay, so that's the beginning of identification of love. So let's define love biblically. 1 Corinthians 3, um, 13, 4 through 7 in the New Living Translation says, I'm going to read it in a couple of translations. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boasts or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. Remember that part. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. Love never gives up, never loses faith is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. In the message, it says, love never gives up. Love's care, love cares more for the other than itself, for than self. Love does not want what it does not have. It doesn't strut, does not have a swelled head, does not force itself on others. Remember that. And it is always me, um, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of sin of others, does not revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in uh, flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, and always looks for the best, never looks back, and keeps going till the end. God's love is infinite. But we decide the way love comes in our identifications. And our identifications might be, have been formed from people. But guess what? If we have identifications of love, they are transferring onto God as well. So sometimes we're crying out for God to do something, but we have an identification of love that we can't even see that he's really there loving us. God wants our version of love to be put to death. Now, we all heard about the love languages, right? Gary Smalley's love languages. And that's the character nature we, re we prefer to receive love in. There's five of them. And they're hearing words of affirmation, quality, time spent together, receiving gifts and tokens of caring, having things done for you, physical touch and connection. Well, that's a little bit different than what we're talking about. Because what we're talking about are idols and demands that we put on other people. But I actually think that in some way our love languages have been perverted through our identifications of love. So you got this little handout when you came in? Just take a couple of minutes and answer these two questions. What tells me or makes me feel loved or asked a different way? What behaviors from loved ones most assure you that you are loved? And the second question is, what do you elicit love pack? What do you do to elicit love packages from others? And if you can't think of it off the top of your head, maybe it, God will show you while you're, doing, while you're here in the lesson.
Okay, God's design for relationships. In Ephesians 5, 21, in the Passion Translation, it says, And now, out of reverence for Christ, be supportive of each other in love. So the proximity to the cross determines how well you're going to do this. So when we are close to the cross, we are subject to one another in blessedness. When we're far from the cross, we're subject to harmful things, to doing harmful things to each other in our flesh. So what does scripture tell us about love, what it should be and what it shouldn't be? We're going to go back to 1 Corinthians 13, 5. And it says, love is not arrogant and love does not insist on its own way. It is not ir irritable or resentful. Unregenerate love, worldly love, ar loves arrogantly, rudely, and resentfully, and it insists on its own way. When we have an identification of love, we're in unregenerate love. And unregenerate love is expressed through our, our identifications of love and the packages it comes in. Now listen to the definition of unregenerate. It says, not a renewed heart or mind, persistent in holding on to prior convictions, opposing new ideas, stubborn and obstinate. Okay, so we're, when we're in these identifications of love, there's a stubbornness that's there that says, and a demand that's there that says, it's going to be my way or I can't receive it. Unregenerate love is use, manipulation, exploitation, demand, control, and possessiveness. It does not offer uh, true love. Because true love lays down their life for another person. Unregenerate love sacrifices others for self. And that's what we do when we have identifications of love. When God created us to receive love, when we receive it his way and identify it properly, it comes through affection, discipline, wise discipline, affirmation, and sacrificial love. When we don't receive it properly, we identify whatever we get from the primary people in our lives. And we take that as our identification of love. And that could be abuse. It could be battering. It could be neglect. It could be gifts and attention. It could be a lot of things. But when we don't get it, when we don't get a lot of love, Whatever the little thing that seems like love, just like the girl with the chicken soup, that was her form of love. And guess what? She's probably thinking, why can't I get rid of these headaches? But that's how she got love, so she doesn't want to get rid of her headaches. Like sometimes we minister to people, and they have this infirmity in their body, and that's one of the questions we ask. Did you get attention for that? Because sometimes people don't want to give that up. Because that was the only way they got the attention or the love from their parents. So in healing this uh, wounded spirit, which is John and Paul Sanford, it says, as our spirit encounters life, it seeks nurture. As babies instinctively search for a nipple and learn how to suckle, so the spirit seeks to, touches of love. God designed us so that our spirit finds love and thus finds the power to live through warm, affectionate, physical touch. The primary driver of our spirit is to find and live in ways which, we were create, which it was created. When we do not receive expressions of affection, which are food and nurture for our spirit, we latch on to whatever substitute we can find. When we identify love, not by affection and open-hearted interplay, I, thou, exchange spirit to spirit, but whatever form it takes, it is though we latch on to the package rather than the contents. So say this package just came from Amazon, and would you want the box or you want what's in it? You don't want the box, right? Who wants the box? Little kids like to play in boxes, but okay. If we cannot have the true contents, 
the package becomes all that important. Since the form of love uh, comes in and replaces true love itself, it never satisfies and it causes us to want more and more and more. And that's how identifications of love are formed. All identifications of love, good and bad, this keeps going out. Hold it here. Oh, okay. We, it causes us to be demanding and to try to control others. It causes us to measure and judge others and defile people in our lives that we love. It's the baggage we bring into any relationship. And again, they always say this, it needs to come to death on the cross. So in healing the wounded spirit, again, it says all of us come carrying pictures and they have become the demands of us for the worldly way in which we judge and measure other people. The other person isn't free to be themselves and give you love the way they can give you love. It's your demanding it the way you want it. Any unregenerate love that hasn't died on the cross, again, is use, manipulation, exploitation, control, possessiveness, and one of the most harmful things in our lives. Not good. That kind of love we learn in the world. So we put demands on each other, and again, we cause each other not to be free to be who they are. Love, the demand takes away the gift. So somebody wants to give you the gift, but you're the demand on it causes that person not to be able to give it to you. So the package becomes more important. So I have this chocolate bar, which David noticed right away. Now, if I open this up, do you want the chocolate or do you want the package? Who wants it? Come get it. Come get it. I don't care who takes it. Just come get it because <laughs> I can't bring it home. So... <laughs> But if I just gave Tim that, if I was just handing out the, 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 the pat wrapping on that, nobody would have raised their hand and come running up here for it. But that's what we do, and that's what we settle for when we have identifications of love. We take the package over what true love really is. And as adults, we identify love by what our parents did or didn't do. And then we, try, we tend to measure other people by that as well. Husbands, wives, friends, authority figures, sisters. Oh, I'm sorry, I did it again. I saw Sam's face. <laughs> okay, so some examples of packages. I have some examples right here. Okay, father working hard around the house. These are packages of what love can look like for people. A mother reading to her child. These are all really good things, right? Well, most of them are. A family working and playing hard together. Small gestures of affection. You know, you always go by somebody and you're always patting them on the back. Or, you know, you mess up somebody's hair. Or like Dick Smith comes and gives you a kiss on your head, right? All right. Those are all, you know, love pats, you know, on a little child. But you know what else is... A package, neglect, abuse, and you name it. There's a million of them that we receive as packages of love. And in Elijah House, they tell a story of this man who they asked for permission to tell the story. And he had severe spinal problems since birth. And he got made fun of a lot. He had surgeries. I probably won't even do this story that much justice. But, um, and he was in so much pain his whole life. She said that um, the kids, he had these bars, and they would, like, roll him down. Like, they'd push him down the hallway, and he'd go rolling down the hallway. It was horrible. And he ended up going in and out of mental institutes in his life. And, but every time he would get under stress, he would go and put a diaper on. And he would get put in mental institutes for this over and over again. So finally, he's going he's gonna to come 
they said, can we please, his pastor loved him, and his pastor said, can you please help him? And she's like, I don't know what we're going to do. All these counselors have seen him. They came with a packet like this of all the things. And she said, please. He, the uh, pastor said, please. And she said, okay, I know how you're going to go to them. Because now he gets put in jail. And how he's going to go to jail. And she says, listen, tell him that your body, soul, and spirit, and this is a spiritual issue. So he comes and he starts talking and talking. And he said, the only time I ever felt loved or kind touch was when I was a baby and I was diapered. So that became his identification of love. And when they prayed through it with him, it never happened again. He never had to go to a mental hospital again. And he was totally set free. All from an identification of love because that was the only time in his life he ever felt love. Really sad, but he's totally free now, so it's an awesome story. So how are identifications of love expressed? Non-verbally and verbally in the form of a demand. If you loved me, you would take care of our home. If you loved me, you would cook my food in a certain way. If you loved me, you would take care of me when I was sick. If you loved me, you would make me laugh. Fill in your blank. If you loved me, you would. And I love John and Paula Sanford. <laughs> if you loved me, you would iron my sheets. John would say to her, if you would iron my sheets. But for her, it was hanging the sheets on. Her mom, she had a... a identification of love that her mom loved her because her mom would hang the sheets on the line and they would smell fresh. So she thought that was love and she thought she was loving John that way. But his mother ironed the sheets. So when he got in the bed and the sheets were wrinkled but they smelled nice, that did not say he loved her. She loved him. Silly little things, but it's that's how we identify love, right? So <clears throat> I'll give you one example from my own life. One of my identifications of love with my dad was to, to protect me. He would protect us. And there was one time in particular, <clears throat> we were young. It was winter. We were, it was like around Christmas time. My mom and dad were upstairs getting ready to go to some event or go out. I don't know where they were going. But, um, and we were sitting downstairs in the family room, and there was two little windows on the side of our door. And my dad was upstairs shaving, and all of a sudden, there's a crash, and a big snowball comes flying through one of those windows. And my dad made it down those stairs, a full flight of stairs, I think in one step, he ran out of the house with shaving cream on his face, half shaved, half shaving, and went and caught two teenage boys, big boys, and dragged them back to the house by the scruffs of their neck and brought them and showed him his kids and said, you could have hurt my kids. And his best friend said, and you could have gotten arrested for kidnapping. But it didn't matter to my dad. He was going to protect us. And I knew that was one of my identifications of love. Now, there might not have been other ones, but that was one of them with my dad. So fast forward, I get married. I'm a high school te teacher. I taught seniors in high school. And one of my students, this young man, did something inappropriate to me. And I was not having it. So... We went to the principal. He was 18 years old. So the principal said, you have to bring your mom in. And his mom already didn't like me because we've already had other altercations throughout the year. And this kid was well-liked in school. He was captain of the hockey team. And so 
But they all knew where I lived because what I taught, they had to, you know, they knew. They, they, kids would stop at my house. It was sometimes a little annoying, but I did love them. So I come home and I tell Paul this. And I go, this kid's not going to get to graduate. Oh, don't let that happen. Something's going to happen. He knows where you live. And I was like, I most certainly am going to do it. He's not, <laughs> he's not getting away with what he did. And I said, oh, my gosh, this man doesn't love me. He's not going to protect me. Because my identification of love was, you're going to protect me. So did he love me? Of course he did. But did I feel that in that moment? No. So then we fast forward a few more years, and he redeemed himself. Because same thing, it's winter time. We're getting ready to go out. And all of a sudden, somebody tries to kick our front door in breaks the door jam, and he goes out after the kids. I said, okay, you redeemed yourself. <laughs> but that's how important it is, right, that our identifications get broken. So what is if I had these identifications of love here? Now, I know most of you aren't old enough to know this, but there was a show when I was a little girl. It was called Let's Make a Deal. I think there's a new version of it on TV now, but does anybody remember that show? Okay, good, some of you. So in Let's Make a Deal, there was uh, curtain number one, curtain number two, and curtain number three, and you could pick, right? But they would usually show you curtain number one and curtain number two. So what if this, and there was a girl, and she'd come out there, and she'd go like this, do you want this one? And it's like this great package, right? So let's pick the good ones. Okay, mother's cleaning your house or father working hard. Okay, would you like this one? Or would you like this one? But behind curtain number three, you could pick that, but you don't know what it is. How many of you pick the curtain number three? Okay. So curtain number one's going away. Curtain number two's going away. And behind all our packages is true love. So behind curtain number three, we might not be able to see what's in the package yet or understand what that true love feels like yet. But this is actually the best package. This has the best contents in it. We want to get rid of these because even the good ones have to die because it becomes an idol in our life. Men often identify with what their mothers have done and how their moms love them. And unconsciously, they make that demand on their wives to fulfill that picture. Sometimes it's based on a judgment against your parent. Maybe it's a judgment against the mother. And then there's this forced fantasy that comes, and it's opposing to the true love. Women often identify with what their fathers did or didn't do and measure their husbands to the same standard. So John and Paul Sanford say they have, John was saying he has the Thelma box. That's his mother's name. And Thelma liked to iron the sheets, right? We remember the story. He, she liked to iron the sheets. But Thelma also had a little nasty streak to her. So it was the unloved box. And if Paula did anything that even slightly resembled what his mother did, even if she wasn't really criticizing him but just making a comment, but it seemed like that, it went into the unloved box, and she, her, the identification of love was not there. But they put demands on each other. So he would put the demands on her to iron the sheets, but until it came to death on the cross, he, he held her to that standard. So I'm going to read you another story. This one is very powerful. This is a, a husband who brought the wife for, to get fixed. Now, we all know that word fixed, right? We talked about that last week. Okay, a woman comes to us bringing her husband, and if you have to hear John Sanford say it, 
and she was bringing her husband. Her problems, she said, was that she could not stop ruling the roost. Her husband would never rise up to stop her. She dominated him completely, but was tired of it. She said she could never rest in him, but she wanted to. Could we find the cause and set this man free? It didn't take long to discover that he had been raised by a controlling mother and older sisters. He was accustomed to, accustomed to being dominated. It was the way he had learned to identify love. Now, if his wife bossed him around, he knew she cared for him. The role was, the role was familiar and comfortable, though demeaning. That was the price one paid for peace and love. Her father was the one, as one would expect, was a weak man dominated by her mother. Neither parent would show affection, and they were both performance-orientated. But the father was gentle and kind, whose feelings were constantly lacerated by his mother's vicious tongue. From the age six, when she left home at 18, her most vivid memory of her father was from the time to time he would come to her and bring to her and bring to and begin to tell her the awful things his mother had said about him. He would break down crying and put his head on her shoulder and she would comfort him. This was the only physical experience of love she knew. It became her identification of love that being a strong woman, you comfort a weak man. As she matured and became a beautiful woman, she met all these men. I'm not going to read the part. This is like, I'm just going to give you the synopsis of this part. She meets all these strong men, these athletes, and she's very beautiful, and all these men want to date her and all that, but she can never date any of them. They're all these big, strong football players and things like that. Then she meets the man who became her husband. He was about the same height as her, not an athlete, not broad-shouldered, but very gentle and kind. It happened that recently he had been jilted by his fiancée, whom he dearly loved. His heart was broken. On the first date, he begins to share his heart, how his heart was hurt, and he cried, and he laid his head on her shoulder. Now, I don't know about you ladies, but if he started telling me about his, <laughs> the girl he was madly in love with on his first date, Easter and I would have looked at each other and said, run, Forrest, run. <laughs> okay? It's one of our favorite little sayings. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. We have a good time with that one. Okay. So you could miss seeing what happened. She identified love. He needed her. Now she could know herself as a loving woman comforting a weak man. None of the strong men had ever been able to trigger that identification. She had no built-in way of reacting to a strong man who didn't need her. The familiar role could identify, accept, and walk in a sense of worth, belonging, and she married the guy. Run, Forrest, run. Anyway, then, so John goes on to say what he does is she can't see it. So as a counselor, he, he, you know, starts a fight. He says a couple things that get them fighting, and then it all comes out. And he gets, her to, he gets to the point where the guy cries, and she, and she comforts him, and his head goes on her shoulder, and she said, see, you didn't, you didn't want me to fix him because that's your identification of love. If I fix it, he won't be weak anymore. So she said, see, you needed him to be weak and cry um, so, so that you could be strong and comfort him. 
Do you see the part of your mind and heart that wants him to be strong for you? The ruling part is determined not to allow that to happen. Okay? That's how strong these identifications of love are. Anyway, they got all fixed up by John and Paul. They broke it, sent it to the cross, and they moved on their merry way. True love sets the other person free to become all that they can be. Carnal love imprisons the others so that they can't be who they're supposed to be. The effects on marriage, when mates refuse to be coerced and comply with the demands, the result is often separation and divorce. You good for another story? This one, <laughs> this one is even funnier. Okay, this one. I think I'm just going to give you the synopsis of it. So this couple comes to them. They had gotten married, and before marriage, everything was okay. So now you could start to see some other little things creeping in here, judgments, inner vows, all kinds of stuff. It's all kind of related, right? So they get married, and everything before they were married was great. They get married. They can't get along. There's starting to be demands on each other. They start putting the demands on each other. So they get divorced. They start to date, and everything is lovely again. And because there's not that closeness that causes them to have to put demands on each other. Oh, I think we could get married again. So they get married again. As soon as they get married... The demands start to go on it. The identifications of what? Yeah, they got remarried. Same couple. They got remarried. As soon as they get remarried, the demands start to come again, and they're like, what did we do? So they get divorced. <laughs> so as soon as they get divorced, they start to date again, and they come to John and Paula. They start to date again. And they said, we're going to get married again. So they get married for the third time. And the demands are still there. So now they come and they go, we can't do this anymore. What are we going to do? <clears throat> the identifications of love were so strong when they were married because of the closeness that they ended up getting divorced. But they prayed through all their things. And then they just decided to just be friends. And so they just dated for the rest of their time together. <laughs> but crazy story, right? Three times. So when our mates choose out of love and loyalty to provide the packages we demand, they live in loneliness, they forgo their own needs to be loved or to give love, and they will never be appreciated for the true gifts they are capable of offering to us. They're virtually disabled by the demands provided, uh, to provide what we think we need. John and Paula say that there's boxes that the other person had to fit into. Not this one. Those. And until those packages died on the cross, we pushed and pulled and demanded and were disappointed. But once we brought them to death on the cross, we were free to fail each other. And because we were free to fail each other, they didn't make as many mistakes. Very important. So um, identifications of love and idolatry and how they work together. I was trying to read um, Psalm 115, 4 to 8 today, and I was like, what did I type? It made no sense. So it says, but their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths, but they can't speak. They have Eyes, but they can't see. They have ears, but they can't hear. Noses, but they can't smell. They have hands, but cannot feel. Feet, but they cannot walk. Nor can they utter a sound with their throats. For those who make them will be like them. And so will all who trust in them. Now, if we go back, listen to this. In 1 Samuel 15, 23 in the New Living Translation, it says, Rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness as in worship 
as bad as worshiping idols. Now remember, that was the definition of unregenerate love. Was Part of it was stubbornness. Idols in any form are a sin. And when we idolize, um, and that which we idolize seems good and necessary in our lives, but God designed our spirits to seek and give love for his glory. But when we worship our own chosen forms of love, we serve ourselves instead of God and others. So that goes back to um, 1 Corinthians, which it says that love is selfish. I can't find that page now. So it isn't selfish and it isn't demanding. Idolatry. And the, the sin of idolatry and identifications of love, God is love. Thus, any identification of love is a type of idolatry. It's a form, we worship a form of love rather than leaving ourselves open to the true love of the Father, which was what David was saying. Because it really does come down to, if you had a revelation of the Father's love, that a lot of these things would go away by themselves. Because you'd have a true revelation and you would never switch, you would never give up those for this if you had a revelation of this, right? But in identifications of love, we demand that people down to the, bow down to the idols of our love. Just like Nebuchadnezzar wanted the guys to bow down, right? That's the same thing. That's what we're doing. We're demanding that somebody bows down to our need for our identification of love to be met. And if furnace is anger, it's like a furnace of fire of anger in us. Because when our identifications of love don't get met, we get angry. And it's very selfish. It's not sacrificial. And if we go back to 1 Corinthians again, it says that love is not selfish, right? So there's where inner vows could come into play. So when love is given sparingly, we cease to recognize true forms of love, and we latch on to those harmful ones. Inadequate forms or packages which tell us we're loved. We distrust that it will come in the way we, in the right way. So we make inner vows which refuse true love, and our vow might be, I will never receive a, a, um, his attention or affection because it doesn't match up with what our identification of love is. It's not bitter root expectancies, though. But it does cause us to have a bitter heart, but we can't see our bitter heart because it's covered up and hidden by our identification of love. We convince ourselves that we don't need love that we haven't gotten because we hang on to these identifications of love, whatever they are. It could be how your mom cooked the food. And if your wife doesn't cook the food like your mother, like say Tim's mom made potatoes a certain way and that was his thing, right? If his wife makes potatoes a different way or doesn't make him potatoes at all, he might think he's not loved because maybe that was one of his mom's signature dishes and she just, you know, that made him feel loved. Like in our house, it would be chocolate chip cookies, you know, because that was one of my mom's things that, she, you know, everybody felt love by her baking. And so you could attach onto that. And then if my brother marries somebody who doesn't do that, it could have been, it wasn't the case, but it could have been that he didn't feel loved because his wife didn't bake him cookies all the time like my mom did. Ideas of love are formed also from judgments against our parents for the things that they didn't do. And we demand it sometimes based on fantasy. Sometimes our identifications of love are built so strong on fantasy and projected so powerfully as we demand that they totally block out recognition and acceptance of love that is very genuine and warmly given. So this is the last little story, and this one I'm going to just... 
It says, one good man came to our home to visit. He had been raised by an extremely critical mom. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, we're, I'm on the wrong spot. Okay, for instance, a girl grows up with a father who's hypocritical, demanding, in, demanding insensitive, and self-centered. She comes to believe that the man will not notice her, care about her, how she feels, affirm her, or provide for her, but will use her to serve his every selfish... And at the time, she builds a picture of what she desperately thinks she needs from a man and dreams that someday she will marry a husband who will stay home with her, listen to her attentively, to everything she says, bring her flowers, candy, and take her to exotic and exciting places, tell her how beautiful she is, and do all the romantic things that she's heard about in movies and books. What would you say? She marries a man who is, in spite of his own childhood woundings, tries to do what he thinks will bless and please his wife. Her birthday approaches, and she begins to build a picture of what a perfect celebration will, she will have. She imagines that the, that the man of her life coming home early from work to take her to dinner and a late show. Dinner will be a fine restaurant with candlelight, soft music, and no one will rush them or break into their privacy. They will hold hands in the show and go for a moonlight drive around the lakeshore afterwards. He will tell her how lovely she is, and she will smile and sigh and feel goose pimply all over. <laughs> okay, the day arrives... <laughs> And she gives him a hint. You could surprise me with dot, 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 right? All day she rehearses this wonderful evening she's going to have. About 5 o'clock he calls and says he will be delayed and he's so sorry. But it couldn't be avoided and he will, he will arrive as soon as possible. Two hours later he comes breathlessly in the door with a beautifully wrapped gift and a box of chocolate in his hands. She is crazy about chocolate. And awkwardly, he, an awkward apology on his lips. He never says, I'm sorry. And then they hurry to the restaurant. Service is slow and irritation mounts as it becomes apparent that they won't be able to go to a sh get to the show on time. Attempts at conversations to de um, degenerate rapidly and accusations and defensive responses, and finally, brooding silence. Attempts at com um, she dreams, her dream is shattered, and she sinks into a black cloud of, he never thinks of me. Leaving his gift and chocolate unopened and unforgotten, what's the use, he thinks, I can't win. Because her identification of love wasn't met, so what he had to offer she couldn't even receive because it was so. And I have a, um, a story similar to that. There was a dress shop on the corner by my house when I first got married. And it had these beautiful dresses, these long, beautiful dresses. And there was one that I absolutely loved. And I think our anniversary was coming up, and man, maybe it was five years, I don't know, it was something that it was an uh, event. And I would dream about Paul going into that store. Now, I never told him any of this. I never hinted about the dress or anything. But I would dream about this beautiful dress, and it was going to come in a box with a big bow on it, and it was going to have a note, dinners at this time, and the limousine is going to pick you up. Where I came up with this, I had no idea. Because I didn't read the stories this lady read, but or watch movies that she. But in my head, I had made this whole fantasy of what this would look like, and guess what? None of that ever happened, and it wasn't even like this big romantic dinner or anything. But it's that fantasy of what if you didn't have it as a kid, you you fantasize of what it would be when you can have it, right? So it's so important that we.
learned how to um, bring our identifications of love to the cross. In severe cases of neglect and abuse, especially sexual abuse, if, you, if a child has been sexually abused, they might identify that as an identification of love. Inappropriate touch is a, could be an identification of love. And so if they're inappropriately touched, they think they're being loved. What about a child who um, is abused? Say a young lady is abused by her father physically. She gets married. What's going to happen? She's probably going to marry a man that's going to abuse her because that's her identification of love. And you wonder, why would somebody stay in an abusive marriage? Because sometimes that's their identification of love, and they actually think they're being loved. And until somebody brings it to them and explains to them that that's not love and explains what true love is, they might stay in that relationship. How do they work for us? Although we put all our energy into acquiring these packages of love, they really never satisfy. You just need more and more. So say your identification of love is gifts. And so your husband brings you a gift or your wife brings you a gift and then just brings you another gift and another gift. And it's really, you open the gift and you go, oh, yeah, that's nice. And then you want the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one because it never satisfies because it's a false thing. It's not true love. So it never satisfies. It brings a constant demand for more. And the more you put the demand for more, the less likely you're going to get it. Because people give up on it. Just like the guy in the story, he gave up. He gave up on, like, what's the use? Why am I even going to try? She's not accepting me for who I am. What I give isn't, isn't, isn't good enough because she only wants it this way, or he only wants it this way. So in one example they gave, um, they talked about addiction associated with identifications of love. And I thought it was so interesting because she says this young woman, as a child, they were very wealthy. They got to do a lot of things. They had a wonderful family. They got to go on vacations. They had a beautiful home. They had big parties. They did all kinds of wonderful things as children until the parents got divorced. And then there was not a lot of money anymore. I guess the father didn't pay his money, whatever happened. And... Um, so she associated love with all this money that she had. She thought love, equal, money equaled love. So when it was withdrawn from her, she felt like she wasn't loved anymore. So I forgot to say she was blind as well. So she went to the casino one time, and I guess somebody gave her some money to do the slot machine. And she gets the slot machine, and she gets a whole bunch of money. And she said, oh, my goodness, I have money. This is love. And because she associated money with love, she got addicted to gambling because that was her identification of love. And as long as she was winning and she was getting money, she felt love again. So she came in, and she got her healing, and they broke it. They brought it to the cross, and they, but it was her identification of love because she didn't know any other way of love other than when she had money as a child. So, excuse me, so she became addicted to gambling. And it could be the same thing with food or any other kind of thing that was your identification of love, which is withdrawn from you, and if there's a way to receive it, and it can be an addictive thing. It could form an addiction in your life that um, you really don't want. So
So how do you get healed from that? How do you get healed from an identification of love? First, you have to realize what it is. Like, you have to think about, like, what is your identification of love? Everybody has them, remember. Now, maybe, you know, we've already been healed to them, but everybody has them. We have to understand how it's manipulation and exploitation and use and demand and control. We have to understand what it does to the other person because it totally shuts the other person's ability to give down. And the more you demand, the less you're going to get. And remember, it's the more you want, the, less, the more and more you need, and it causes it to be the less and less you get. You have to identify the bitterness that's there. You have to reclaim the ground given to Satan. You have to bring the identification of love to the cross. You have to renounce it as an idol in your life. And, um, oh, there's one other little thing that I gave you. Um, I did, I'm not going to go over it, but this is really a, a very powerful tool. It also goes with identifications of love. It's counterbalance. And the counter, uh, common counterbalances is, say you're married and the husband talks a lot and the wife is quiet. If one person talks a lot, the other one's going to be more quiet. If the other one is loud, the other one is going to be like more soft-spoken. If one is really super highly religious, the other one is probably going to be a little wor more worldly to balance it out. But we need Jesus in the middle. So I would encourage you to just read that through. It's really good. And then you just try and help somebody. You have to help them to see what they really need, what they really want, what they really like, and encourage the giving and receiving of many packages of love. So we're going to pray. I want you to look at your sheet when we do this, when we pray through this prayer. Just look at this sheet that hopefully you've identified something in your life that might need to come to the cross. Some place where you have felt like you haven't been loved the way you needed to be loved, but your need was really the wrong need. So if we could stand, we're going to pray this prayer together. It's a prayer to restore true love. Just read out. You could read it. We'll read it together. And if I mix up words, just keep reading, okay? <laughs> Father, we affirm again our love for you. And at, this, at the same time, confess that we have formed a picture of love that has limited our ability to feel and receive your love in multitudes of way. Your express ways you express yourself sorry we repent and ask your forgiveness for the smallest of our vision we give to you our pictures of love now you can look at that little sheet that I gave you and put in there anything you might have written down we ask you to cause us to be aware of any others we give them to you and we ask you to bring them to death, the positive as well as the negative. We see how we have defiled our spouses, family, friends, and coworkers because we could not receive the way they expressed caring. We insisted that they fit into our molds, not allowing them to be themselves. And it says, identify those defiled or ways you are aware of defining them. So if you have any, just say, you could say it out to yourself.
Forgive us, Father, for our idolatry. Cleanse us with your love. Lift away our false identifications and implant your vision of love for us. Open our eyes to see you and each other in a new and surprising ways. Help us to hear your words of love to us and through one another. Grant us boldness to say and do things that will love and bless others. And the courage to go outside our comfort zone to draw nurture from you, your creation, and those you have placed in our lives to bless us. In the name of Jesus. And Father, I ask that you would just come into every place, Lord, where our hearts didn't receive the love in copious amounts like John, John says. Lord, I ask that you go back into those places, God. And where we haven't seen it before, God, I ask that you, like we just prayed, open our eyes, that we could bring them to death on the cross, that we would not limit you or limit the people in our lives, God. That we would get a fresh revelation of your love, God. Lord, I ask that you just pour in your liquid love to every place where these false identifications of love were born in our lives. And Father, that your liquid love would just run through and replace every false identification of love, God. And that our hearts would be able to expand, that our hearts would expand with your love, God, for you and for others. And Lord, I just add one thing to that prayer is, God, we ask you to forgive us for defiling you with our limitations of what love looked like or how we receive it. Because it could be towards people, Father. But an identification is an identification and it also is projected onto you, God. So we ask you to forgive us for projecting onto you what our earthly parents didn't do and believe in that you love the same way, God. We ask you to forgive us and we receive your love God, and we receive your forgiveness, God. And God, we choose tonight to open our heart and for you to pour in that liquid love until the only thing that comes out of us is that love, Father. And we just thank you, Lord. We thank you, that, Lord, that you are the perfect father. And the mother heart of you is perfect as well, God. So we have the mother and the father heart of God in one. And we just thank you, Lord. We thank you for the divine exchange that's happening right now, God. And we just bless your holy name. And I just bless each and every person here, God, to receive that love. In Jesus' name, amen.